Um, thank you all for attending this afternoon. For those of you who have not met me yet, I'm Valerie. I'm your academic advisor here at the Hub for your first year. And then here we've got two of the faculty advisors who many of you will be transitioning over to at the end of the semester. Professor Sam Louie is not here today, so we have some slides and things like that. I'll briefly talk about him, and then um, we have our faculty here to introduce themselves, talk about chemical engineering, you know, this information, and then at the end we'll have some Q&A that kind of goes back and forth. So um, what we'll do first is I have a couple of slides here to introduce to you just to talk about the relationship between faculty and um, advisors such as myself. And then I will briefly go over some important dates and deadlines that are coming up as we near the spring break and then full sprint to the end of the semester. So um, we have it already. We have snacks over there. Feel free to grab some throughout your time. and. Um, following this session at the very end, after our Q&A, our faculty members will be here for you to kind of go up, introduce yourself if you'd like, and you'll have a friendly face to go off of when you transfer over to faculty advising at the end of the semester. So, um, briefly to talk about the partnership between hub advising and faculty advising within the School of Engineering. So, as you all know, your first year here as an engineer, you work with the hub. So, um, as your academic advisor here, I'm trying to think, I advised Chemies for the class of 2021 and now 2023, so it's great to be back all with you. Um, what we do for the first semester here in the hub is really help you get started at RPI. So, we, you know, get you started with the templates. You guys have become very familiar with these if you haven't already. This is kind of a guide for your four years here at RPI. Um, we also have, um, we'll discuss things like choosing courses or any registration time. Everyone has a mandatory meeting with me <laughs> once a semester. Many of you have made that. Actually, my chemies are kind of the first place in terms of making state student advising meeting, registration meetings with me. So good work to you all. Um, and then um, we'll also discuss really any questions that you have. I don't have to answer myself. My thing is that I will get you to the person who does. So a lot of familiar faces here. Keep on coming in. Um, we do a good deal in terms of um, helping students get started here academically, choosing courses, general questions. You know, how do I do a minor? How do I drop a course, add a course, pass no credit a course? What are the HAAS requirements? Which is actually the number one question that I'm getting these days has to do those pathways. So. That's really what I'm here to do, is kind of help you all make sense of that. Um, we will kind of just start on your four-year plan, too. So moving forward, as you transition over to faculty advising, you'll have a good idea not only what you're doing for the following semester, but semesters moving forward. And our faculty advisors here are to help you for the next three years here at RPI. So they know a good deal of major-specific information. They help you get started with a major continuing. They are here for things like, you know, career mentoring. They can help answer questions for graduate school as well. Um, possibly give advice about undergraduate research, which faculty members, that's one of the number one questions I get here during these events, is how do I get connected with research? A lot of those um, extracurricular and outside the classroom opportunities like co-ops and internships, study abroad, um, and uh, just kind of in general continued support. So we'll be hearing from them in a little bit here. So a um, couple important dates on my end for you all to kind of uh, keep in mind. The drop deadline for courses is this Friday, March 6th. So if you are considering dropping a course, um, you can talk to me first if you'd like. Just make sure that you're not dropping something that you really need You know, going into the next semester for fall registration. Um, so before you leave for the spring break, if you're going to drop a course, make sure that you do that then. The pass no credit deadline is Friday, April 10th. So you have a bit of time on that one. So courses that can be pass no credited include um, those that you're not using toward your, um, you know, your pathway, those that you're really not loving the grade that you're getting, you don't want it to hit your GPA. So typically it is Haas courses and free electives that you are able to pass no credit. You cannot pass no credit something that is required of your major. Um, and then, 
Both February and March is consultation month. So if you haven't met with me yet, you've probably gotten enough emails from me saying, come on in and meet, you know, get your hold cleared. For those of you who have had the same hold cleared, it's a pretty easy meeting, right? Pretty quick, not too bad, yeah. Um, so that's what I'm here for, is to kind of talk about those classes the next semester. And then coming up after the spring break pretty quickly, you guys will be hearing about registration week. So soon you'll get your time ticket information, which will let you know when you register. And the registration actually takes place March 23rd through April 6th. So um, as you know, first year students, typically your registration is toward the end of that time period. It goes by credit, so as you get older, you'll get better registration times. Um, ROTC and athletes may have different registration dates as well, depending on seasons and so on and whatnot. So, with that in mind, um, briefly we're going to kind of introduce our three faculty advisors here. Um, Samuel Lee is not here today, so I'll kind of go over a slide with information that he hoped to share with you all. And then here we have Dr. Ronald Hedden and Dr. Todd Privetson. Okay, so, um, for those of you who got your emails today, chances are you have one of these two uh, professors for your faculty advisor. So we'll kind of go over some um, information with you and I'll stop talking here. So first, for Professor Sang Wu Lee, um, if you all have him for your faculty advisor, this is kind of the information that he wanted you all to know. Um, so his research is investigation of thermodynamics and structures of polymeric materials using experimental methods. He uh, attended school at, at South National University in South Korea, and then he got his PhD in chemical engineering uh, from the University of Minnesota. And then um, he said he's been interested in chemical engineering so when, since he was young. Uh, to him it seems to be a very balanced field because he can pursue research interests from both the fundamental science to materials engineering and then into the field of chemical engineering. So um, if you have him as your advisor, you do have uh, an email with contact information should you have any questions. And again, you move onward and upward after this semester. So next, we will introduce our faculty advisors who are here. So go ahead. <laughs> I'm Todd Provitzian. Uh, some of you I may have met over this past summer when you came to campus with your folks. So, welcome. Hopefully things have met your expectation uh, so far. Hopefully we're keeping you plenty busy and challenged as well. Um, I'm here for my second uh, tour of duty. I actually started my uh, academic career here in 1991 and was here all the way through 1998. I went for 20 years to Carnegie Mellon University and a year and a half ago I came back uh, to Tartan and uh, been here ever since. Um, from my own background, uh, I did chemical engineering and chemistry as an undergrad. I couldn't decide between the two, and the program was set up in such that I could pursue both. I would encourage you, if you've got interests that kind of dovetail or, or even orthogonal to your chemical engineering interests, you know, interesting minors, music program, what have you, explore those other aspects. They help you kind of round out and develop kind of your whole uh, repertoire, if you will, of expertise. I did my undergraduate work at Washington University in St. Louis, and then I did graduate work uh, at Caltech in California. I entered the biotech industry uh, in St. Louis, worked there for a couple years, and I came here uh, to RPI to start an academic career and work in research uh, in uh, biotechnology. Continued to pursue that kind of research. I'm based, as the slide says, in CBIS, which is the Center for Biotechnology and uh, Interdisciplinary Studies. You may or may not have been in CBIS yet, maybe you have, um, but uh, that's where my office is, that's where I'm found. It's probably easiest uh, to get a hold of me uh, by sending an email, although I have been playing around in Slack a little bit, so if I may, uh, for those of you that are directly advised by me, it's probably one third or so-ish, this group, maybe that might be another way. Uh, but definitely reach out by email, uh, it does not bother me at all to ping me if you send an email and it's like, you didn't send anything, you didn't respond, and it's been a day, ping me. That does not bother me or upset me at all. I get so many emails coming in, and uh, sometimes I have a bad habit. I'll look at it and I'll say, yeah, I'll do that, but something else will come in and then I'll get distracted, something shiny over here, right? So, um, and it just kind of slips in my queue. So, definitely ping me. 
I'll see if uh, I get used to uh, Slack a little bit better. That's how I interact with my graduate students, and that might be a way to uh, get kind of my direct attention. Certainly, if, if you need something, obviously you're pinging me because you need something you'd like to interact, but if, if something is really immediate, please let me know, put it in caps or something like that so I can respond to it. I don't want you hanging, particularly if you've got something urgent that needs to be uh, addressed right away. Um, that about cover it? Yeah, all right. Yeah. That's all you run. All right, so I'm Professor Hedden. I'm a uh, professor of practice, which is a little bit different, uh, which means I'm assigned full time basically to teaching and advising of students. So um, research is a uh, minor activity in my office these days. So uh, let's see, this is my second time advising students at RPI. So I know, uh, you know what you're going to be facing, what most of your questions are already. I guess I'll be picking some of you up uh, pretty soon as advisees. You'll come in with the same old problems I've seen before, so should be able to help you figure that out. Uh, stop by my office anytime. It's in the lounge in the uh, Ricketts building. Surely you have seen our enormous lounge in chemical engineering, right? Okay, so basically go in there and then look for the men's bathroom in the back corner. My, do my door is buried in that corner, but the good news is it used to be belong to Professor Hendrik Van Ness, who's a pretty famous chemical engineer and has a series of textbooks. So it's considered a sacred place in the department, despite its location. <laughs> so uh, just uh, don't knock on the door that says Van Ness on it. My, my name's not actually on it yet. We're, we don't want to take it off. So um, knock on the door. I'm in there. And um, it will come out and answer your questions. It's, uh, since I do teach three courses a semester, it's a better idea to schedule an appointment with me. If you keep dropping by and can't find me, it's because I have three courses to run, and I'm probably in one of them or having office hours for them. So emails are great, get on my calendar. Uh, if you're going to be a chemical engineer and stick with it, chances are you're going to have me teach you several chemical engineering courses. And you may be good and sick and tired with me by the time you graduate. But hopefully, we're going to build a good relationship in the first one and then keep that until you graduate. And then you can, uh, I guess, egg my car afterwards. Uh, but we have to get along for the next three years. So uh, <laughs> you love the optimism. So um, <coughs> things I teach include um, Triple E, which is thermodynamics, uh, CPDC in the summer, which is process control, senior lab one, senior lab two, and uh, chemical process design and chemical reactor design most recently. So I've taught all those courses in the department the past two years. And uh, I can almost list the ones I don't teach, which is everything bio. <laughs> and the two transport classes and mass and energy balances are MEBL because everybody wants to teach MEBL for some reason. So uh, that's, that's pretty much, uh, you could have me for four, maybe even five classes by the time you graduate because of my position here. So we should build a good relationship early on. Uh, in terms of um, research, I do, my, I have historically been in polymers and materials area. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and my PhD in chemical engineering. But in research, I always did polymers and materials. Just like you'll meet some people who have both degrees in chemical engineering, and every research project they've ever done has looked like biology. There are those people, you know, that's, and then there are the energy crowd that have their degrees in chemical engineering. So there are different flavors to our discipline. Uh, so if you ever look up my papers, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff about polymers and material science, but I assure you I am a real chemi, and uh, I'm here to teach you chemical engineering. Um, so my PhD was in Cornell, one of our neighbors across the state in the snowier direction over there. And uh, that was back in 2000. And after that, I worked at a federal lab, which is NIST in Maryland. So maybe some of you are from the DC area, you're familiar with NIST. And uh, after that, I went uh, back to where I got my undergraduate degree at Penn State. And I was in the materials department for a while. And I didn't like that as much as Kemi. So I moved to Texas Tech University in Lubbock. And I was there for eight years. So if anybody's from Texas, y'all are hereby obligated to come tell me that afterwards, have a conversation. So um, uh, I really had a good time at Texas Tech, but my family lives up here. So I decided to relocate to the Northeast. And RPI had this position open that was full-time teaching, which I really loved doing. And I applied for it, and here I am. So that's the story of how I got here, three schools. This is my, I'm on my third one now, unbelievably. You're only on your second, right? Yeah, as a faculty Only. member. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I got to keep up. Yeah, right. 
And um, other things I do besides teaching students and giving you horrific homeworks and projects um, uh, include my virtual reality work. So if you're interested in virtual reality, that's my small research project right now, staffed exclusively by undergraduates. We're actually developing virtual reality applications for you, for teaching purposes, not for you know, standard research purposes. So uh, believe it or not, there's already a virtual reality lab experiment that the seniors got to do last fall, and we're expanding it, to, expanding it to be a virtual chemical plant that you'll actually be able to go in and run within a year or so. So virtual reality is coming along. And outside of work, um, I suppose I like outdoor stuff. Uh, I do astronomy and astrophotography, which is kind of a typical engineer's hobby, I guess. And I also play the cello, which is a little bit unusual. I've played that for 37 years or something like that. So if you're musical, you also have to come have a conversation later. So anyway, that's me in a nutshell. Great, thank you. And actually, we have a couple of students who are either interested in materials engineering minors or duels as well, very ambitious. Right. Um, so yeah, definitely that crossover with different fields and such. So. Great. All right, well thank you very much for the introductions. Um, so I guess a couple of questions on my end, we'll go that way, and then um, at the end you'll have your chance to ask questions of the students first. I like to do that to get people talking, and then they can ask you questions too. That's good. Um, so, Todd, you talked a little bit about this, I believe, but when did you know that you wanted to be a chemical engineer? And um, was there like an experience or um, something that got you into this field? Yeah, like I suspect maybe many of you, I had strong interest in chemistry and I really liked math. And everybody looked at me and said, oh, chemical engineer. And I said, what's that? And luckily I had a, a cousin who was about five years, still is, five years older than me. And he was at the University of Rochester. I grew up outside of Rochester, New York. And uh, he was in his senior year, and I spent a long weekend with him on campus. And he just kind of introduced me around and talk, talked about chemical engineering. And was like, yeah, it's kind of obvious to me. That's what I need to do. So it was that combination of the interest in things molecular and in chemistry and the interest in math and, for me, applied math. So you're a Wegmans fan, then, outside of Rochester? I am. Okay. I am. <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, I actually picked chemical engineering out of a catalog of college majors while sitting in the guidance counselor's office in like 1990 or something like that. <laughs> and I guess I made a good choice because I'm still here, right? So uh, the thing I can say about chemical engineering is that, you know, since the early 1990s when I first looked at it, my parents said, chemical engineering, what is that? We're not paying for college. That was the response. Um, <laughs> they changed their mind. So uh, since that time, I've never seen a stone cold job market, even one year. Uh, it might be at its minimum right now. It gets cool, and it takes a little bit longer to get a job, right? But you will get a job. But it never goes stone cold. Like There's no demand for chemical engineers at all. It just doesn't happen. Chemical engineers come out with such strong problem solving and communication skills out of this discipline. You can do math, you can do computer coding, you can write technical papers, you know how to give presentations, that your skill set is highly coveted. And if you don't get jobs as standard chemical engineers, other disciplines will more than happily siphon you off. It's viewed as you know, one of the strongest undergraduate backgrounds you can have. You'll find that uh, if you go to graduate school, that people in materials, chemistry, and physics will aggressively try to siphon you off and come do your PhD in their lab uh, at many schools. And uh, that was my experience when I went to Cornell, is that the materials department wanted me to jump ship and come across the street. And I said no, and I stayed in chemical engineering. Um, so, uh, but you know, it's uh, a discipline that's very rigorous. It's not for everybody. It's, it's tough work. It's going to, be, going to be challenging both before and after graduation. Believe it or not, it's not going to get easier when you graduate. It's not like you got your degree and now you've made it. You just get handed buckets of money. It continues to be challenging. And that's why not everybody can be a chemical engineer by profession. But the rewards are pretty rich. That is one of the highest starting salaries. And like I said, the job market is never really that bad. So you guys are in a, a good position to be chemies. And let me tell you why. It's because you're enrolling in chemical engineering on an enrollment dip which means when you graduate, there will be maybe half the people available looking for jobs that there are this year. It's gone down probably 50% in the three years. 
And uh, what typically happens is that, you know, this, it goes nationwide. Right now, this class and the previous one were maximum enrollment here. The next one's a little lower. And when that happens, the number of jobs doesn't fluctuate that much. So there's just two or three times the competition to get them, right? And your class the, uh, is smaller than the previous three. So you're in a good place. I would stick with it for you um, for a job market. Um, so my feeling is uh, the original decision way back in 1990 was a good one for me. And I think that it's going to be a good one for you too, regardless of what you end up doing coming out of here. Great, that was a great outcome for him. I, uh, I chose a catalog from yeah, the catalog and chose major, and here I am. So well, that's awesome. Um, so we talked a little bit about challenging semesters and such, and what I wanted to do is get the feedback from you both. Um, what are some important and or challenging semesters that students should keep in mind for the next three years? I think the challenge builds, right? Uh, been my experience uh, and you might think by the time you get to senior year it's like uh, you can push in the clutch and relax but now you're trying to figure out what comes next on top of all the classes it's just it's a busy time it's a busy time I, one of the biggest transitions I think though is from freshman year to sophomore year uh, because uh, the expectations, expectations are high for freshmen, but the expectations just grow, and it's a big kind of step change, I think, in the level of the level of challenge that you'll experience. You know, there's this phenomena kind of globally across colleges, a sophomore slump kind of thing. Why does the sophomore slump occur? Same students coming in just the next year. Well, freshman year is kind of special. You're new, you're figuring it out. Everybody's like, oh, look at the new folks. Help the new folks out, you know, get them adapted. And then sophomore year, it's like, well, you're here now, right? Do it. And all the attention that's lavished on the freshmen, you know, it's the next year's freshmen are coming in, right, and getting adapted. So it can be a little bit of a disconnect. The experience is a little bit different. Also, the amount of technical and content, particularly in the domain in engineering and in chemical engineering, that takes a big jump up. You know, you're mainly working on background sciences now, and background math, and your has courses and, and all of that, but the technical demands take a jump up. So just be ready that you know, sophomore year will challenge you as well. There are lots of opportunities to seek help, and that's one thing I should mention. I mean, we're here to help. Folks here are here to help. There are lots of offices and facilities and resources to help in a lot of different domains, both from you know, kind of personal issues, technical challenges, course challenges. The biggest mistake students would make would be not asking for help. And somehow assuming that asking for help is some sign of weakness. I can't be here because you know people will know I asked for help. That's foolish. The help exists because we know people need help. Use it. Right? When you need help, admit it. Ask for it. It's not a bad thing. It's a sign of strength when you can actually figure out something's not going right, I need to do something different, I need some help to get this done. Just kind of blundering through and muddling through, that usually doesn't get to a, a satisfying place. Ask for the help. Be ready that next year is going to be a step up. You're going to be challenged in, in even newer ways you haven't been challenged yet, and realize that there are all these resources. Use them. Use them. That's why they're there. Challenging semesters yes. is the topic. So I guess the uh, if you ask any given student what's their most challenging semester in chemical engineering, it's going to vary from person to person. Traditionally, at um, previous two schools I was at, the first semester junior year was just very difficult in terms of coursework. Um, there wasn't much flexibility when you took those courses, but uh, uh, things are a little bit more flexible here. So it's, the answer is going to vary from person to person. Someone might find that a big step up in um, and the, the technical challenges going from uh, freshman to sophomore or sophomore to junior, you know, results in a semester where they don't get the grades that they used to. And we do ask you to take a pretty big step up. So you're going to take mass and energy balances. It's all right. And then we're going to take triple E, which is thermodynamics. That's, that's a different level. Okay, end of sophomore year. That is a lot more work. Concepts are much harder. When we get to junior year and some of the courses 
might be even more challenging, right? So there is a ramp of, of, of you know, challenges as you go from freshman to senior year. What I find causes a, a difficult semester or a challenging one for a student is when they overload themselves, and that's where your advisor comes in. So the person who decides, I'm going to take 22 credits this semester, and it's all engineering, math, and science. And I do have students that have done that. I don't know how they were able to pull it off, but they did it and got through it. But they didn't do anything else except classwork that semester. And if you're also trying to go to the job fair and find an internship in the middle of that, yes, you're going to have a rough semester. And you can make it rough for yourself like that. Uh, very often there's too much of a rush to get out of here as fast as possible. And uh, that results in some of this cramming of courses in the graduate in three and a half years or whatever the case may be. Um, uh, your advisor should be able to tell you whether they think you're making a mistake or not. I guess that's where we come in is to say, are you sure you really want to do this? What are you going to get out of graduating a semester early besides less tuition, besides, besides that short-term benefit, okay? So um, last semester, you're going to, believe it or not, after going through chemical engineering, we're going to put you in a group of four people and we're going to ask you to design a chemical plant essentially from a blank sheet of paper. And there is no assignment. You have to come up with it. That's called capstone design. You're going to design every element of the plant and analyze its economics and simulate it in process simulation software. By the time you're a senior, you will be so good at this that you will be able to easily handle that. Believe it or not, the growth between sophomore and senior year and the students is absolutely unbelievable in chemical engineering. Seniors are like young professionals, and you can see just two years ago they're in your office crying over homework assignments. That was so easy compared to what you're doing now, and now they're just taking it all in. And uh, typically you work very hard your last semester, but I find it's not too stressful because everyone gets such a sense of satisfaction out of doing their capstone design project and finishing their courses. It's like everybody's inspired to work really hard at the end and just get to graduation and then go to the senior banquet, which is a really nice event, by the way. And, uh, and uh, most of our faculty try to attend it. So your toughest semester, I believe you're probably going to make it for yourself. I think that's my answer. I would just say, too, in terms of load, uh, my advice to advisees was always, sure, try the harder load. Try the heavy load. Just be ready to fall back if you need to and recognize it. And don't be afraid to say, this is more than I can handle right now and have a plan for falling back. It's the folks that just try to bulldoze through it that really make a headache for themselves. Try it. Try it. Just as you were probably counseled when you came in the door here trying to figure out what math class you should be in based on the math experience that you had in high school. You know, try the higher level math. Well, I sit through the same stuff you've already seen before. Right? But then if you figure out, hey, but I didn't quite see it that way, right? falling back. Right? Just have a contingency plan and don't be afraid to invoke it. It's not some strange admission of, oh my god, I couldn't do it. It's like, well, yeah, you tried something really challenging, you got smacked in the face, step back a little bit, right? Try it again next time around. It's the whole idea of try it, but be willing to ask for help uh, and be honest with yourself and say, you know, why am I torturing myself with this? Let's step back. That's more than I bargained for. If you're successful in it, terrific. It's wonderful. Great. Thank you for that. That's a lot of the conversations I've been having with some of these students. So you hear it from faculty too, you see? Um, so Believe it or not, we were <laughs> way last century. We were in your shoes before. <laughs> but it was last century. Last millennium. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Exactly, and they're here to help, we all are. And I think that's a really great point that you stress too, is a lot of students don't reach out, um, but that's what we're all here for. I mean, that's why these men are in these careers here and teaching and working with students and us as well. So I guess one more question for you both before I turn it to you to ask questions to them is, I do have a lot of students who are interested, uh, express interest in research. So do you have any advice about getting involved in research here at RPI? Sure. Uh, definitely hit websites, right, for the faculty. See what they're working on. See what kind of strikes your fancy. Maybe a ton of things that interest you. That's cool. Or it may be one specific area based on experiences you've had already that, that you really want to try out. That's good too. But hit the websites and 
you know, it could be a faculty member in chemical engineering, it could be a faculty member in material science, it could be a faculty member in chemistry. It, you know, it doesn't have to be with a chemical engineer, although it very well might be. And it doesn't have to be with somebody that you already had a class with. Uh, it's maybe a little bit easier if you already had a class with somebody and you've had a chance to interact with that faculty member a little bit more. But if you're in larger format classes where you know maybe it's you know all engineers together, a lot of folks together, maybe you haven't had a chance to get to know the faculty member, it's fine. Go knock on their door. You send them an email and say, hey, look, I've been checking out your website. This looks really interesting. I'd, I'd like to try out research. Can we set up a time to chat about this? To me, every faculty member is different in this respect, but to me, the, the thing that drives my interest in taking on students is their enthusiasm and interest. Because, you know, in research, and particularly if you're just getting started out in research, you're learning, you're gonna make lots of mistakes, there's gonna be problems, there's gonna be challenges, and you gotta have that kind of self-motivation and interest just to kind of push through. And that doesn't change at the master's or PhD level either. You gotta have that, that kind of drive or it says that, you know, I'm having a hard time solving this problem, but you know, I'm gonna do it because I'm excited about it and I'm motivated. So that's the important thing. I, I look for that motivation and excitement and enthusiasm. And if you can convey that to any faculty member or numbers of faculty members that you might find have programs of interest to you, you know, based on checking them out on the web, what's available, information that they have about their research programs, if you can express that motivation and enthusiasm, that carries a ton of weight. Um, I'm not sure what to say to wrap it up. Give me a cue for my question again. Um, any advice for students who'd like to get involved with research? Okay, so um, be patient. That's my first thought. Uh, so there are more students that want undergraduate research positions than probably we can accommodate right now. And maybe with the decrease in enrollment, it's going to get better. Uh, for example, for somebody like me, you know, I have maybe 5% of my time to spend on undergraduate research, teaching three classes. So I have three students right now that work for me, and I couldn't take anybody to work on my project besides that. So if you ask your professor, and you ended up um, getting disappointed that he doesn't have an opening or she doesn't have an opening at the time, um, you could try asking again the next year. You could try looking at other faculty in the department. You could try looking outside the department. You're actually allowed to do research in chemistry or physics or materials or whatever gets you interested. You're allowed to do that. There's no rule against it. We're not going to get upset with you. Uh, and the last thing you can try to get a research position is try applying for REU programs. That's research experience for undergraduates at other schools during the summer. Okay, so many schools have these REU sites that are founded by the National Science Foundation and they're specifically to support undergraduate researchers for a summer and give you some amount of money for going there and doing a, like a research internship, basically. Okay. Um, who should be thinking about undergraduate research? That's a big question. I would say if you're really interested in getting a PhD and having a research career, it's more important for you than it is for somebody who's just looking for a little bit of lab experience to boost their resume. Right. And priority should really be given to people that want to get uh, apply for PhD programs in engineering or sciences afterwards. Um, somebody has to help you find a lab position so you can get some experience there. It does help you get into graduate schools later. Uh, but be patient ab above all because not everybody has room in their group for 15, 20 undergraduates that want to do research. It's hard to keep track of all that. And uh, if you're teaching courses and doing other things, then uh, the more undergraduate you bring into your lab, the less attention you can give to any one student. So it's, it's actually not very good for you if we do that. So my limit tends to be around three. Uh, at, at times I've had up to seven and it didn't work out so well in my previous lives. So uh, I tend to cap it off around three. Advanced planning is important as well. So these REU programs that, that Ron mentioned, due dates for applications are probably right around now maybe with a couple weeks plus or minus, something like that. Realize that as, as first year students, it's gonna be a little bit more challenging because there are other students with more experience or sophomores and juniors that are also looking for positions. So it's a little bit tougher as a first year to, uh, to find these positions. Not impossible, but tougher, you gotta be persistent. Uh, 
if you were looking or thinking about uh, trying to line up a research uh, experience, say, uh, during first semester next year, right, in the fall, a good time to start lining that up might be in April, right, in March, sometime in April, talking to faculty members, kind of getting on their radar and getting that lined up showing up kind of the first day of class or the second week of class and saying, hey, you know, can I get into, into your lab for the semester? It's going to be a little bit tougher. Plan in advance, right, for this. And usually the rule of thumb is half semester to a full semester in advance of the, of the time that you'd like to line something up. So plan to see, be persistent. Uh, and for these REU programs and, and other similar type programs at National Labs, et cetera, you've got to have your wits about you in terms of keeping an eye on due dates, right? So if that's, research experience is something of interest to you, and I would would argue that if, even if you have, you know, possible interest, you know, not definite interest, try it out. You know, it's another thing as undergraduates, you should try as many things as possible, both academically and non-academically while you're in college. Figure out what it is you like, figure out what it is you don't like. This is the time in life to help Try to sort that kind of stuff out. Maybe you have a research experience you can find, hey, that was okay, but I don't see myself doing this. Maybe you have a research experience and you figure out, well, you know, I liked research, but I didn't like research in this area. Maybe I should try this other area. You know, so I worked for a year in this lab, maybe I'll try another area. Or maybe you work in an area and you figure out, I love this, this is exactly what I want to do. All three of those outcomes are very important to help kind of sort out and figure it out. Again, as undergraduates, try as much as you can to figure out what it is you like, kind of in all dimensions of life, and what it is you really don't like. And kind of help, help you kind of self-discover and, and find yourself. That kind of thinking um, brings up the common situation that some people are maybe thinking about graduate school, but they also are thinking about just getting a job after graduation. That's a very common situation. I stayed in that state until September of my senior year in college before I made my mind up as to what I was going to do. Uh, a research experience in a lab can help you sort that out, right? And we know that, that you may actually do research for a semester and say, you know what, I don't really like this. That's okay. It's acceptable to us. I mean, it's for you that we put you in the lab, that we can accommodate you. And other people decide right there at that moment that they've got to have a career in research and they decided to go the PhD route. Um, that being said, those of you that are pretty much 100% sure that you want to go to industry after graduation, you don't want a PhD, um, I'd like to encourage you to pursue more of industrial internships and less of laboratory research experiences. They're not really the same thing on your resume. Um, companies, when they go to hire graduating seniors, are really looking to see that you have some kind of industrial internship or co-op these days. It's gotten more and more important to get interviews, to get jobs at graduation. It's almost become essential the past five years or so. Lab research is not the same thing in the eyes of those people as work experience at a company. Okay, so it's not a replacement for an internship. So if you fall into that category, you really want the internship if you're going to go straight to a company after graduation. That's what they're, they're hoping for, so you should go get one. Okay, so that's my take on it after with a lot of data behind it. Okay, thank you. Um, that's a good way to wrap this up, I guess. Do you have any questions for our student audience here? How's it going so far? Going all right? Finding time to breathe? <laughs> Hopefully you're not finding time to cough if you're doing so your cough your elbow. <laughs> Who knows what kind of challenge we're going to have there. I haven't had time to breathe in between the head colds this semester. I'm on my, I had my fifth one on Saturday. Yeah, seriously, that is right. I should have told you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna get all five, of the, all five of them at once now because he sat next to me. So, uh, um, yeah, hopefully things are going well. You're not too stressed out. That is, that is one of the problems that comes up at RPI is um, just stress levels get out of hand sometimes, right? I'm sure you, if it's not you, it's one of your friends. You're allowed to come talk to your advisor if things are out of control, that's another thing. You may not need to talk to me to, to sign up for courses. You may um, 
you know, I had a student last semester where I went down to the lab and the, the person was just standing there with their goggles fogged up. It looked like they came out of the shower. And I was like, well, what happened to that person? And there were tears streaming down her face. I just saw her an hour ago. I said, well, what is the matter? And she just said, it's just everything at once. It's just getting to me. So we went upstairs and talked for a while. And then she was happy. And uh, I told her how to deal with it when you've got too much on your plate. And she was happy. And, uh, you know, that situation got resolved. No more tears. If it's one of those days where you feel like the world is crushing you, you can come talk to your advisor. It's all right. Um, we, we need to work hard to, you know, I mean, you guys are, you're always going to get hard workloads in your chemi courses, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to do something that's large and challenging as a major, and there are going to be those times where it all piles up and you just can't believe it. But there are ways to get through it because all the previous classes got through it. You've got to just start telling yourself, the previous students got through this and got jobs, so why am I not, right? So that's one way to deal with it. And uh, the other way to deal with it is to break things up into small pieces when you start to feel overwhelmed. Don't let thoughts spin around in your head about, about how many things you have to do for next week. OMG, this is impossible. Just sit down and do one thing and don't think about the rest and do it and finish it. And then don't think about it and go on to the next one. All right, so uh, there are ways to manage stress if you're feeling it. And uh, for those of you that are not feeling any stress, you need to take more stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep an eye out for each other, too. I mean, you're going to be in a lot of classes together, right, as chemical engineers. You're really going to get to know each other well through the, through the years that you're here and hopefully build a good rapport with each other. But kind of keep an eye on each other, right, because people are going through stress at different times and, you know, all kinds of stuff happens outside of school that impacts family stuff, right, you know, family health issues, all kinds of different stuff. Who knows what's going on for Keep an eye on each other and learn to recognize when somebody else is kind of struggling and help them talk about it and help them find some resolution too. So that's important to look out for each other. Okay. Any other questions to the group before we have them ask them back? No? All right. Hey, group. If you guys have any questions for our faculty advisors? Nothing at all. We were really good at running. We rocked. Right? We answered everything. Everything. Until we meet them later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, um, we'll kind of have you guys hang around and yeah. meet people. If you'd like to come up, meet your advisor, ask them questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, let's get a round of applause for our advisor. <laughs>